Okay, so officially we're at episode 25, and I think I've run out of ways to intro these episodes, Alex. Good, perfect. No intro necessary, just... No, we're just... I'm just gonna hop into it from now on. The second it the is music fades Easter. out. Yeah, we'll hop on into it for Easter. <laughs> but just, just from now on, just all of a sudden, just... Ah! And then, all, then we're just right into it, so... Get used to Scream. that. <laughs> Get used to that, folks. Thank you for joining us on Total Pebble Knockdown. I am Nathan. And I am Alex. And we have three more uh, segments for you. Fresh out of the podcast oven. <laughs> we have a podcast oven. We invested heavily uh, into crypto and bought one. Oh, yeah, exactly. I have an NFT of an oven that has a little digital bread in it, and they swear that I own it. All right, so... <laughs> The uh, first topic uh, of, for discussion, we have a weekly muse. And um, so a couple weeks ago, we had talked about, uh, you know, the importance of uh, video game uh, preservation and what or was happening. the importance of not preserving them and being Nintendo. And being Nintendo. And... Uh, Basically, the, the idea that it was all kind of going to a streaming service at that point and um, making it harder for people to actually purchase the games. Uh, a lot of them not going to be able to be purchased. And um, how important that was and the difficulty therein. Something I ran across while I was looking into that was this neat little story uh, from February out in Nebraska where... February of this year, right? Yeah, February of this year. <laughs> okay. Not from last year, yeah. No, Just it's making sure. It's it's fairly recent. Okay. Uh in Nebraska, they uh found this rare video game collection which potentially could be worth millions of dollars. I bet it is just a ton of Atari ET cartridges. You know, the ironic thing is, if you actually came across, like, a whole, like, load of, of like, mint-in-box ET cartridges, they probably are worth quite a bit of money. Since yeah, they... for people who want to throw in fires. No, no, because they, cause they <laughs> eliminated so much of the stock, because they put it into the landfill. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but uh, this is a, a little article that they had. It was mostly on the local news in Nebraska, which is why I, I was just fascinated that I came across it but in lincoln nebraska uh they uncovered this uh wonderful video game collection and then a guy named chris thompson who owns the game room it's a it's a video game uh show Rum? store yes <laughs> it's it's a video game store remember those where they'd sell actual games yeah yeah well they they still exist um he uh, was asked by some owners uh, that they had this large collection, large stock of video games, and asked them, hey, are any of these worth anything? <laughs> so he goes over, and what he finds became a little bit of a viral sensation. Basically, there were just these boxes upon boxes, shelves upon shelves of video games that came out of a store that closed back in the mid-90s. Uh, actually, two Nebraska gaming stores that closed down in the mid-90s. And they've basically been sitting in storage for 25 years. Good place for them. Yeah, I, it certainly is, especially if you thought of this as an investment, which I don't think they really did at the time. Um, because while he couldn't put a specific evaluation on it, he was talking about the fact that some of these might be worth like $50, um, if they're factory sealed and in poor condition, they could be a thousand. And then if they're mint perfect, best specimens of their kind, factory sealed, which several of these look like they are, he's saying hundred thousand. Yeah. Now, to be frank, I think that's a tad high. Me personally. Um, maybe. I only I only say that because I've seen some uh, things like you know the the limited edition gold cartridges for some of the old NESs and they're worth tens of thousands but I haven't seen a lot of things that are like hundreds of thousands they've been factory sealed gold cartridges there you go if they if they did find some that were like the limited edition gold cartridges that were mint in box factory sealed I could see it I could see it but I mean let's let's be real Pokemon cards are selling for a 
lot of money. So m there's a market for anything. Oh yeah, yeah. Anything that you have to the right collectors will be worth something. I um, have a lot of skin cells. Uh, yeah, that's a very specific market, Alex. It's a very specific market, but man, let me tap into that market, please. That's true. Um, you know who really uh, likes dead skin cells is the uh, the lotion companies, because uh, they want to they want to corner the market on those. That's why they keep making moisturizers. Anyway, um, so Thompson was saying that if he even liquidated the entire stock that he had in the game room, he wouldn't have enough to buy the collection. And when you look at the video, it's kind of fascinating because the, um, the boxes that they have, you can tell that it was stock for a game store because there's like seven copies of the same game. Yeah. Uh, so things like Genesis era SNES that sort of thing. There's like six copies that they have of like Aladdin, the old SNES Aladdin that are all just sealed in box, which I do have to say today, uh, knowing like how much, how many of those pretty much got tossed <laughs> away it, are probably a pretty rare item at this point. Some of them, right. some of them games that I had never even heard of when I was watching it. So, I thought that, that was very interesting. I start wondering how many of us out there might actually have games that are, are you know, shuffled away into a box somewhere. And uh, Most of mine. Most of yours. I'm gonna guess that you, you don't have any that are, like, still mint in box or sealed. Probably not. Pro any game I bought, I probably played. Yeah, see, I have that thing, too, where usually I buy games to play them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I do remember a phenomenon back in the day, though, where, like, uh, I, when I had Ninja Turtles, you get the Ninja Turtle action figures, and Dad had this, like, thing where he'd say, uh, okay, we'll get you one, but then I'm getting another one that we're keeping in the box. <laughs> so, did he? <laughs> yes, he did. <laughs> Somewhere there is a box of unopened 1980s uh, Ninja Turtle figures somewhere, and that that's a good thing. I have to find those. Probably in the old house. No, they're, no, no, I did grab them. I made sure to get them. <laughs> Fun fact, though, uh, when I was looking them up in the inbox, which is what I'm curious about here, you know one of the most valuable of all of, like, that run of the Ninja Turtle figurines? Um, Bebop? No, the Foot Soldier. Really? Yeah. Well, if you think about it, who bought the Foot Soldier and thought to keep it in the box? <laughs> you just bought yes. a bunch of Foot Soldiers and took them out of the box because you didn't think they'd be worth anything. <laughs> uh, I, I think that that's kind of the idea. It makes me start thinking that there's a lot of games in here that were probably, like, popular. And the, the fact that they were popular is the reason why it's so rare to see them in, you know, in the seal. Uh, it it kind of makes me think of those um, pop funk figures mm -hmm. that you see everywhere yes. that people collect by the dozens. Mm -hmm. I have a friend who used to collect them. And mm -hmm. it's like a couple of years later, she's like, I don't know why I collect all of these. I need to get rid of them help yeah, yeah um but they have like a wall of them oh yeah like, yeah stacked floor to ceiling across several feet of the wall and it's like why i don't understand that one personally i don't really care about action figures a whole lot but it's like yeah. all right but if you're just gonna leave it in the box as a display piece mm -hmm. i don't understand right right i'm like what is the point of these aside from this purpose you, you know what they are, Alex? They are the modern-day commemorative plates. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> kind of like, like, one day these That's will be the worth episode it. title. Modern-day commemorative, commemorative plates. plates. <laughs> yeah, and it's exactly. just a, po a bunch of pop funks. Mm. I, I think, too, and I've started to realize this, when people buy stuff that they think they're buying as a collector's item, it probably won't be. Because everybody's buying it to be a collector's item. Yeah, you don't generally make an item going into it mm -hmm. as a collector's item. And no, if you no. do, it's a limited run. 
Yeah. Yeah. Which I guess the pop funk things do that specifically because you know people were doing that. Right. So like, oh, this one's a rare. It's like, okay, but it's a manufactured scarcity. Yeah. yeah. Not in like a natural scarcity. It's not like right. This is hard to find because it's been lost. Sure. Or didn't perform well. It's it's this is hard to find. Because sure. we only made a hundred of them, so we could sell them at a premium price. Yeah, yeah. The the manufacturer's scarcity part, I think, it always makes me a little bit wary, only because I feel like it's not going to um, pan out <laughs> because of that. Uh, one of the best things, really, to collect is what people are enjoying for the fact of enjoying it. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's why Pokemon cards were worth money because people were playing the game and i mean currently they're worth money because you know i think jake paul well probably probably that too but you know they they had like i remember back in the day pre jake paul remember those days <laughs> remember those days remember the pre jake paul days um oh those were good times but those back were the best Back then, you could have, like, a holographic Charizard, and it was worth money. It was still worth money. Um, because, but people were playing with it. A lot of action figures, if they are still in box, are popular because people actually did take some of them out and play with them because they enjoyed them. So, right. there's an... It, it, people don't really want to buy a collector's item of something they have no personal investment in. But... <laughs> we say that, but we're also partial to the tabletop game scene as well mm -hmm. where there are people who will buy games just to put on their shelf to look nice on their shelf that is true that is true but but when it comes to like the archaeology because like in this particular article they're talking a little bit about how it's not a process for him to be like throwing these up on eBay. This is where historians, documentarians are going to get into it because there's a lot, lot here for him to even process. When it yeah. gets into when it gets into those stages, it's going to be the items that are in good condition of stuff that people played played back in the day. That's going to be worth cash, right? Um, you know. Even if you have a fairly good condition, like all of our lovely games that are on the wall, if no one actually got out there and like played the thing, it, I don't. I don't think it's going to have as much of a valuation because the market isn't there. People didn't play it. Um, so you're saying Dark Souls, the tabletop game? It might not uh, retail so well uh, on secondary markets. Just, just say probably not. Chances are you want to just play that when it comes I mean to... chances are you don't want to play that or you don't want to play that <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh if if uh okay so now now the thing I'm thinking about to just kind of close out the segment is if I had just one of my games still around that I had held on to that I thought was going to be worth money I'm trying to think what that would be um I think when I had gotten the original NES, uh, I had Legend of Zelda, and it was in a gold cartridge. Oh, there you go. Kind of wish I had that. Um, that's fair. That's fair. Mm -hmm. I don't know if uh, any of the games I had would be quite so collectible. Uh, yeah, it's it's hard to tell, too, because sometimes you'll buy the ones that are, like, in the nice cases or whatever. Maybe maybe the original Half-Life. Oh, yeah. Like, um, the orange box. Sure. Sure. I keep thinking one of the better things to have had around is not necessarily the games, but, like, the some of the peripherals that they had. Like, oh, yeah. I don't re know if you remember on the N64... But there was one, the Rumble Pack. Oh, yeah. Which now is just in controllers, basically. But then there was also, <laughs> I remember doing this, there was like the memory upgrade booster thing that was like this little cartridge that was like red on top and it stuck into the top of the N64. And it, it was necessary to get the RAM 
so that you could play the games later in the life of the console. Yeah. So when I had, so by the time I got to Banjo Tooie, <laughs> it it needed such a draw distance that it literally needed this like four megabyte or whatever RAM stick or something that would go into it. And it's like, look at the amazing graphics you get on this. It's like, yes, yeah, nice. It's <laughs> like the draw distance twice as far. That's nice. Uh, got got this little peripheral. Kind of wish I had that because I feel like that's something that most people did not keep around. <laughs> And still Probably. need, and still need Fair if they're going to play it in N64. But anyway, uh, yeah, if you're out there and you're listening to this, what kind of collector's item uh, from video game history would you be looking for? And do you uh, do you happen to have one around? Maybe it's worth trying to go out in the garage and check, or into the attic. Maybe almost time for spring cleaning. It's almost time for spring cleaning, and it's time to find out. Uh, if you have a cartridge around. And if it's an E.T. cartridge, actually, you you might want to check on that. Don't toss it in a landfill now. <laughs> no landfills. No landfill for that. All right, uh, next up on the show, we have a soapbox. And, um, Alex, we uh, we got to talk about something that I know you were hoping we didn't have to bring up again. but I was hoping we wouldn't bring this a topic up again for, like, the 16th time. Well, it's, uh... It's going to come up at least this time because it's a topic that requires us to discuss that at least to start with. Um, <laughs> because every time a Souls-like game comes around, and we are currently experiencing one right now with Elven Ring, there is a topic of conversation that comes up. You probably know what that conversation is. I do. Yeah. Uh, but... For those of you listening who aren't sure which topic we're talking about, Nathan. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, the question that seems to come up is, should Dark Souls have an easy mode? And the inevitable reply that you see back is, uh, get good. That's the whole <laughs> thing. Is the get good mentality. Um... This is actually a topic that gets brought up a lot, yeah. and Dark Souls is a prime example of it. Uh, over yeah. the years, there have been lots of conversations about it. Mm -hmm. um, I know... I think Yahtzee just did a, a thing about this again, also. Yeah. I'm bringing and, up Zero Punction a lot. <laughs> yeah. Punctuation a lot lately, because we're on on same page with a bunch of things. Oh, but. sure, sure. And uh, some of the other ones that I listen to, like um, Jim Sterling and um, Skill Up, have a tendency to talk about these things too and and listening to all of those opinions i had uh had had some thoughts on it and I, I think i've kind of come to my own personal conclusion and feel free to tell me if i'm completely wrong but you're completely wrong perfect. i don't need to know your opinion to okay tell you that <laughs> so so here's the here's the thing um i i don't actually think that souls likes need to have in easy mode. If the game developers decided that they wanted to make a game like this and they wanted to make it challenging, they wanted to make it hard, I, I say let them do what they wanted to do. Um, accessibility, that's another issue. If, if you can do that so that for colorblindness, anything like that, please do that. It's just helpful for the gamer that's out there. But if, if you've created a challenge or like essentially the rhythm game like Dark Souls and that's the way you intended it to be played, I don't think you have to have an easy mode. And if you are playing it and it's not working for you, there's plenty of other things to play. They make other yeah. Souls-likes that are easier or do have, like, Jedi Fallen Order is that kind of game. It's a Souls-like and it does have a story mode. And believe me, I was in it. <laughs> I, <laughs> I played in that mode because there's... You mentioned that the story mode felt too easy. Yeah, well, the thing that's interesting about of Fallen Order is that if you're playing it in the normal mode, it definitely feels like a Souls-like game, but where you're a Jedi. When you play it in story mode, it feels a lot like, um, like the uh, Jedi, well, no, like Jedi Academy oh. or, um, or Jedi Knight, like those things where you, where you feel like a badass, uh, you know, lightsaber wielder going around and smacking things. And, but that's really fun for me. <laughs> <laughs> like, that was a really fun experience, being able to go up to Stormtrooper and just slicing through them left and right like this. Yeah, I mean, power, power fantasy can be fun, if done right. 
And if you're a Jedi, I certainly hope that I'm getting that power fantasy. So yeah. it worked. It worked for me when it was in the Souls like kind of mode. I was like, why am I a Jedi? I don't seem to be doing very much to stop these uh, these little teeny freaking soldiers or this yeah. toad. Um, uh, but you know, I've I've played some with varying difficulties and difficulty sliders. I don't think that Souls that Dark Souls itself, if it, if it doesn't want to have different kinds of difficulty modes, it's not behooven to do that. Yeah, if the game is designed to be challenging and tough and for a specific group of people who like that, sure. I don't think making an easy mode or a story mode is necessary. Again, it's like if you're playing a puzzle game. Yeah. And there's normal mode, there's hard mode to make the puzzles even harder and more obscure, and then there's an easy mode that just holds your hands and tells you how to complete the puzzles. You know? Right, right, right. Um, and and I think I think an example of like that yeah. would uh, I believe what was it Undertale that did that where at one point the mother character or whatever I I didn't play Undertale I'm sorry. Um, I, there's I, a room full of traps and yeah. she just goes walks you through it like just yeah. deactivating all the traps for you but that's a deconstruction of that right so it, like, it is yeah so like okay do you want a game that's gonna do it for you right because that is also generally not fun right right um i think that it's it's fine to have a challenge if you do find that it's the kind of challenge that you're just not engaged with Maybe it's just not a game that you want to do. Like, it, it, like Souls likes are not gonna be something everybody has to play. Trust me, I'm not in that camp. <laughs> I don't actually, uh, you know. Sometimes I'll do it just to try them and see if they, if I like the formula. But by no means have I liked every single one of them, and mostly for that reason that I think that they're that you know they get into parts where it's a little feels cheap and unfair, or that I could get good at this game. But I don't want to, so I'm not going I, to bother. I could get good at this game, but I don't want to invest that much time to get good. It's not interesting enough for me to take the time to, the time to do that. And, and that's one of those that. things, too. And, mm -hmm. you know, Dark Souls, Souls like uh, from software games specifically, um, the story is really neat. Mm -hmm. in Dark Souls. Uh, I don't know about Elden Ring specifically, but like you have to search for it. Yeah. So the story is not necessarily engaging unless you're engaged with finding it. So it's, right. you're playing for the gameplay mm -hmm. a lot of times, I want to say. Yeah. Um, yeah, like hot take inside of a hot take here is that um, besides the gameplay of Dark Souls, I... I'm gonna say it. I was not thrilled with the with the world building. I know that that's a that's gonna be a controversial take, but I always felt like soul like the Souls franchise kind of kept me at arm's length from the world itself. Yeah. See, the, there are people who go into deep dives about the world building of Dark Souls, for instance. And yeah. if you watch those videos and the breakdowns, it's really interesting. Like the sure. entire story of Dark Souls is really interesting. Mm. But like you got the gameplay <laughs> to get that yourself without somebody else just doing a whole hour long video about it. Yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot to ask. Yeah, the, like like I understand that like the story and the richness of that story is there, but it it really doesn't engage itself for me at least. It wasn't engaging itself for me to learn about it. I, I didn't have the desire to learn about it because, again, it felt like it was keeping me at arm's length um, where I'm just kind of in this world and I have to seek out the story. It's not really presenting itself to me as I go along. In that right. Narrative. It's it's kind of a weird dissonance between the gameplay and the story. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit in that regard because I think ones that I have tried that our Souls likes will present its story more uh, directly throughout the course of the game. Like, it, it will present itself in, in a more straightforward fashion. Maybe that's part of it. But, um, that, that all being said, <laughs> on the topic of getting good, um, my general frame, <laughs> my general mindset is this. You can get good. I don't have to care. Because the thing about it is, is that I, I, I understand that there's people that really love to, to talk about how they were able to overcome these challenges 
and that's great. Um, it's not gonna get you at the cool kids table. I I really wish it used to work like that. <laughs> I wish I wish I was able to go up and say, "Hey guys, I beat Ninja Gaiden," <laughs> and 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 have people kind of go. Oh, wow, you beat Ninja Gaiden? How'd you do that, Nathan? And it's like, I had too much free time on my hands. I mean, in some Way circles, that'll much. get you further than others, but the probably average, just with the diehards. Yeah, the, the average person on the street is probably not going to care. And it's especially, I don't think there's anyone who's really going to appreciate it as like an opener, like an icebreaker to a conversation. Like just going up to somebody and kind of going... Yeah, I did 360 no scope and Halo and Legendary. It's the um Great. <laughs> the scene Terrific. from Scott Pilgrim vs. the World where he's at the party trying yep. to talk to Ramona for the first time. He's like screws it up. It's like you know what he's called Pac-Man? It's called see Paku Paku. And it's like don't talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you kind of have to know your audience for that. But, like, uh, on the same token that I can say, like, the game can be hard if it wants to be hard, and that was the intention of game designers. I similarly share some viewpoints with some of the people that I've been hearing where it doesn't, it, it doesn't have to be that you either get good or you, you, you're a loser, dude. <laughs> no. You get good or you get going. Or you get going. Yeah, exactly. Um, getting good is, is great for the people that want to get good, and it's a nice personal challenge to overcome. But, um, that, that doesn't mean that you're going to end up on an esports team, guys. I'm sorry, that doesn't mean that it's going to be your profession. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be, like, people don't necessarily want to hear about it. Uh, it, you know, I, I don't necessarily want to talk about with somebody... Uh, you, like, how you were able to totally, like, like, own every single boss in Elden Ring, and it was so epic, it's like, yeah, that's nice, but, um, right now, we're playing Dungeons and Dragons, <laughs> so, so maybe There's we There's a time can... and a place. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I think- And, and to be fair, yeah. uh, I know in our memorable, memorable, memorable moment section of our Discord, mm -hmm. um, We've had a couple of people talking about Elden Ring or sharing stuff with Elden Ring, and some of those things are really cool. Like seeing some of that stuff done is like, oh, wow, yeah. that was really neat. Good job. Nice. Like that's awesome. Oh but yeah. Like it's not for everywhere. It's not going to be like, oh yeah, talk about it all the time. Right. Because it's like the entire thing, but it's like, right. No, some of it is. It's like, wow, that's actually really cool. Right. Like, I, that apparently that's hard. Good job. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And and to be frank, like, on our Discord, where we have those uh, forums, that really gives the appropriate format. Like, that's that's the place for stuff like that. Um, but if, uh, if we're going to use, and this is really the point I wanted to make with the soapbox, is if you're going to use the get good to try and make it feel like other people aren't as good as you, fuck you, because I don't <laughs> care. <laughs> I do no that, longer please. care. Yeah. Get going. Yeah. If 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 all you care about is getting good, you can get going. <laughs> How about that? If all you want is clout. Yeah, I'm yeah, I don't I don't care about clout chasing. I don't play games for the clout, uh and and I know some people no, do. We podcast for, for the clout, Nathan. Yes, we podcast for clout. <laughs> this is clout chasing right now. I'm standing up for people who can't get good. Make sure to like and subscribe. Finally on the show today, we have uh, one more thing because uh, I have jumped back into a game that we've talked about on the, previously on the show. Uh, that and, our, Alex, and on our previous show. On our previous show as well, and that Alex actually had done on stream on the previous show. Uh, yes, you did. For like seven hours or something like that. But uh, Who knows? Kingdoms of Amalur, Re-Reckoning. Yes. And, uh, for the record, for those who don't know, uh, Kingdoms of Amalur was a game that came out a good 10, 12 years ago. Came out right around the time Skyrim came out, which was unfortunate. For a lot of people, yeah. It was probably bad timing. For 38 Studios, it was unfortunate. For 38 Studios and big, huge games, it was not good. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> but 
The irony of that whole situation is that the goals that they had set for them, eventually, I, I think they actually did meet them, but it wasn't in the time frame that they wanted, so. Yeah. But, uh, for those of you who are not aware, Kingdom of Amalur was a very ambitious game with a very um, storied pedigree of designers and uh, graphic artists and storytellers that built uh, basically an epic RPG. Uh, that had a little bit of like almost the Elder Scrolls sort of open worldishness, but also I felt it shared a lot of similarities to stuff like Fable in how it was designed and laid out and the look and feel of it. Um, it had a lot of really interesting things going for it, but we kind of thought that the series was all but dead, and uh, it, it probably is. But then uh, a couple years ago, when it was bought by THQ Nordic, they decided to do a reissue of it, which was called Re-Reckoning, and they also made note that there was going to be a new DLC for this game that came out a decade ago. You know, I want to know hmm. how that was received. Uh, well, the early things from impressions I heard from individual people is that they actually liked what they had done with it. I have not gotten to the part where I have played it yet, I'm not that far in, but I do have the Fate Sworn edition, so I will be able to get to it at a certain point. Um, I had previously already played the Dead Kel and the Teeth of Naros when, when I tried this a little earlier, uh, so I'm, I'm familiar with those. But I haven't gotten to the Fate Sworn part. I think you have to be a higher level in order to do that. But, um, but I was curious while you're looking that up. Uh, about the differences, the big differences between the original and the sequel, or the reissuing, the reckoning therein. And so, uh, one of the first things I did was try the, like, the sliders to, you know, pull out my field of view, my FOV yep. slider. Uh, pull it out a little bit. I found if I pull it out way too much, I start to feel like I'm in an ARPG and I might as well just be in Diablo. Uh, but uh, pull it back a little bit so I can see more of the world. Um, maybe tilt it up a little bit. But the camera controls, it was nice to see that. It does look better than the original did uh, by by a bit. Uh, they they went in and they did some redesigns on some of the, the stuff there. Uh, it still plays pretty much the same, uh, I, I would say. Uh, they might have done some uh, little tweaks behind the scenes, but... What I've been trying to do is, unlike other times that I played the game, where I'd, you know, want to go through everything that was in each part of the game, you know, do all of the stuff, find all of the lore stones, uh, do all of the side quests when I got to new towns and stuff like that, I decided I was going to focus on just doing the main story parts. And uh, I've done some of the side missions when I came across them, but most of, mostly I was just seeing, okay, well, like, can I actually get to the end? Because I really only completed this once when I did my complete uh, run-through that was like 80 hours. Um, and so I'm in the last section right now. Uh, so I've been through, like, Cluricon and I'm into Alabastra, which is like the last area, essentially. Uh, and I visited all the other ones, down Tarth and Detir and all those. Visited those, did the story, the main story missions, essentially. Um, I think I've probably been at it for, I don't know, maybe 10, 15 hours or so. And I'd say maybe 10 of that is, uh, you know, running through the story itself. With some stop-offs to do, you know, a few other things in town. And, yeah, doing inventory management, because, like we talked about last time, <laughs> everything that has it, you're going to spend a part of your time doing that. Um, yeah, I mean, it's not too terrible with inventory management, but you do need those backpacks. You really need to find the backpacks, yeah, as soon as you possibly can. And it also helps when you have, like, the mercantile skills, so that if I do break down, because I, I usually have to break some of the junk down... I can still get some gold for it when when you actually do break it down from your junk inventory. Um, one thing I was kind of surprised by, though, is I can't just drop items. Like, uh, I, I could... And if I want to destroy items, I have to get them into my junk before I can destroy them. And if I want to use them, I have to take them out of my junk. To, I feel like there could have been a more streamlined way to do that, but... Eh, whatever. It's, you know, it's functional. 
it's just not as streamlined from a UI perspective. It, it probably could have been uh, fixed. But one of the reasons why I wanted to go through the main story is because I'm kind having not gotten a prompt on it for the Fate Sworn part at the start, I thought, hmm, I might have to actually do the storyline in order to do the Fate Sworn part or get to a certain level, so I might as well run through the main stuff. Um, now, that being said, it is almost inevitable every time I try playing Kingdoms of Amalur, no matter what, what kind of things I'm doing, I seem to always end up with the same build. And I don't yeah, know if you like with Skyrim when people always end up with the same build. It, I don't I don't know why it is. Maybe it's just because it always is the thing that works for me. But I am almost always going the universalist path. I, I put like equal stats into my sorcery, my finesse, and my uh, might skills. And uh, so that you know I, I can go through the universalist path. When you actually do get through, like, the entirety of that path, one of the big things is that you get a plus three in all of your skills. <laughs> and which, which is great, because if you want to do crafting, if you're doing, like, the social skills in the world, or, you know, lockpicking or anything like that, you just gain three levels in everything um, when you're in that path. But also, that you just get straight-up damage bonuses to everything, and uh, a reduction of requirements for everything as well. Right. So it becomes really useful in general to do. Um, there are a lot of good options too if you wanted to do a cross class or if you want to go straight in. I usually, and you can fate weave at any time if you wanted to try them. I never do. <laughs> Again, I don't do that. But uh, I, it's usually that. I'll do Universalist, and of course, my main weapon is going to be the Chakram. I feel, I feel like there is an opportunity to do one of those challenge, you know, th those challenge videos like they usually do for the Fallout games or Skyrim. But do one for Kingdoms of Amalur. Can you beat Kingdoms of Amalur without using the Chakram? <laughs> That's the only thing. Well, the only I know thing. one of the things they added in with the Re-Reckoning was also the difficulty slider to harken back to oh, yeah. um, the first segment. They right. added the difficulty slider so you can make it harder. And I guess the harder mode is actually challenging. I'm sure it is. Um, I'm just on the default difficulty setting, uh, which I guess is normal. Because uh, they you know I, it, it wasn't so much that I wanted a challenge. I wanted to uh, see what the game is now, more than right. anything else. And uh, you know, I like I, I always liked the world itself. Uh, oh yeah. Um. Well, you got to figure Arya Salvatore. Oh yeah. The the design is incredible. Like of the uh, monsters. And... Well, sorry, not even just Arya Salvatore because that was writing mostly. So the world yeah. building that way is great. And then. Um, Todd McFarlane. Todd is McFarlane the did the actual for doing all the design. art direction of the world. Yeah. yeah, with the FOV slider being able to pull it back. Yeah, so you can actually see. So you can see what the design of the the art design was. Yeah. I remember what I, you're right. I did stream it. I remember one of the things I was like, "There's an owl in this tree." Yeah, I have never seen before. The stuff you miss. That was the one more thing of the segment. Was hey, there's an owl there. <laughs> It was a hoot. It was a hoot. And it is a kind of amazing because being able to see like this um, almost like curated director's cut of the game uh, and, and seeing the stuff that was kind of getting missed, I, I feel like if this stuff was in there originally, maybe it would have been, um, you know, better received. Just because there's stuff that we didn't even know we were missing, like, of course, Owl and Tree. Yeah. Uh, like Owl and Tree. Um... Did you get a chance? You didn't really have uh, the opportunity to play like the Dead Kel, Legend of Dead Kel, or the Teeth of Naros expansions. Um, no, I hadn't played those. Okay. Um, I, I think they were included with Re Reckoning, though. Yeah, they're all part of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have like fifteen hours into Re Reckoning. Um, sure. But I I kind of do all the side quests while I'm doing it. So sure. 
it's harder <laughs> to yeah. get through it. I, uh, well, see, that's the thing, is that I had p- tried picking it up a couple times over the years after I did it the first time and played straight through and did everything. Because um, I wanted to try it again, you know, and see if it was still, you know, on newer hardware. I bought it, a, this is like the third time I think I've actually purchased the game. Um, Same. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I wanted to actually see, you know, on newer hardware, you know, better, better beef to it you know uh what did it do and inevitably it's because i got down in the weeds and just wanted to do everything that i never actually completed it so this time this time i was like okay you know what i'm just not gonna worry too much about all the other stuff i'm just gonna do the actual main stuff because the the interesting thing is there's lots of side quests, and it takes you to all of yeah. the neat dungeons and, and uh, you know, castles and stuff. And, and those are all great. But the stuff that's on the main story path has much more of the big cinematic moments yeah. of the game. Um, there's the Balrog, essentially, that you have to fight. That's this gigantic thing with these big claws that come down, and they smash into the ground. And it feels for a second, it feels like you're playing God of War. Where you're like trying to smash at that and the head comes down and then you can smack the head and then it goes back. Um, a lot of the big boss fights are in that. The places where you're running through and the, uh, you know, the, the forts are t- crumbling down on top of you while you're running through. Uh, all of that basically kind of happens in the main story. So yeah. it's, it's exciting. I think it's more, it is actually exciting to do that because I figured, well, I know that at the end I can still go back and play because that's Fair. how the how it works. That's kind of like how I had to finally play Skyrim. Is just kind of beeline it? <laughs> More or less, yeah. I was like, all right, I actually want to finish like the main storyline. And mm. like, what I consider the main two storylines are the uh, Dragonborn and like the stuff with the Greybeards. Um, and then the Civil War. Yeah. So I did that. I finally made a character and I went, I think I went, uh, did a different build than I normally do. I went heavy armor, two-handed weapon, mm-hmm. and just brutalized things. Yeah. I eventually did go into like conjuration as well, but I was like mainly two-handed heavy armor. Um, mm-hmm. And I went through it doing that, and I actually finally beat the main story for Skyrim. And I was like, all right, that was that was alright, that was good, that was, that was fine. Took four hundred something hours to finally get there, but you know, I got there. Yeah, yeah. And then you finally got to the part where it's like, oh, here's Alduin. There, we got that going on for us. Um, it is sort of the same thing that I had to do when I was playing Skyrim when I got to the uh, Dawn Guard, because when I yeah. picked up Special Edition, uh, I had never played Dawn Guard. I had tried the Dragonborn expansion. And played through all of that, but I had very little interest in doing Dawn Guard, to be honest with you. Uh, and that one was another one where it's kind of like, okay, we're just going to try to just beeline ourselves right through yeah, this. Yeah, I, I feel like I'll eventually have to do the same thing in uh, Fallout 4. Uh, yeah, yeah, um, because I do... Sorry, Bethesda, <laughs> I didn't care about my son that you kidnapped. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, I do... Nowadays, especially when I was doing challenges for Fallout New Vegas and stuff, I did find myself trying to skip a lot of stuff along the way <laughs> to to yeah. get to the end. Of course, that was mostly when I tried to do that one stat challenge because I hated myself that day. And, you uh, did. And I was like, I'm just going to try to get to Vegas as quickly as possible and get into the Strip. Because it's uh, this is a pain in the ass, let me tell you that. <laughs> it's, don't try the one stat challenge, folks. It's um, I, I, I haven't seen anybody try that. For reasons. It. It's not it's not enjoyable. I can tell you that much. It's like it is the Dark Souls of Fallout New Vegas. <laughs> um, so you'll have to report back in once you get to the new content of Amalur. When I get through the Fate Sworn part. Um, we'll come back and we will do a segment on it, uh, probably in another one more thing. And I'll tell you what basically the Fate Sworn is and if it does anything new to the formula. Uh, because, Perfect. Because that's what I'm really wondering about. When you're doing the main quest line, I feel like you get more experience than doing the side stuff too. So I've been leveling up fairly fast. Oh, good. Uh, so 
yeah, you know, I, I, I'm toward the end, but I'm already, and I, like I said, I'm 10 hours or 15 hours in, and I, I'm level 23, 24 already, so, uh, you know, it, it, every time you complete one of those main story missions, it's like, here's like 15,000 experience or some, some crazy amount, it's like, cool, I'll take it, I'll take all the experience you get. Um, want to get to the last boss, the last boss is really cool, uh, and see that, uh, might play around with the other DLCs, but my main thing is I want to try Fate's Warn, and I want to get to that part. So, but in general, uh, it doesn't hold up. Uh, I think so. Yeah. I, I think so, and if it's an opportunity for people who didn't play it the first time to play it now, good. Um, I It could have easily been one of those games that very much like the game collection we were talking about before, kind of gets lost to the ages and you don't see again. Uh, yeah. And I'm glad that it uh, it didn't get buried <laughs> and just remembered by a few fond people, basically like us and and Ellen, <laughs> basically. <Yeah. laughs> basically, besides us and Ellen, I think that they're, they're kind of got lost to the ages. I get that reference. Good. I do. Yeah. I thought it was fascinating when you were playing it on a stream and like nobody and it, this is like our audience no one knew what this was <laughs> they were confused what is this game <laughs> and then and then all it takes is one of those fate weave finishers where you like stick the glowing stick yeah. in and you just throw somebody on it it's like whoa that's yeah. cool yeah those are fun yeah it's really it's really amazing stuff um, but yeah, Kingdoms of Amalur Re-Reckoning is, I'd say, a good example of doing, like, a, a reboot, remaster of a game. Um, I've, I've seen it done very badly. This is a very good one, and I like that it's kind of, like, even bringing in new content. So when I get to that, I will report back. I'll tell you how that was. All right. Love it. It's a promise. Don't spoil it for me, though. No. I mean, actually, you can spoil it. It's fine. No. I wouldn't do that because, obviously, I'm the Fateless One. And I am Fate Sworn. Fate Sworn approved. Um, <laughs> there was only the one kingdom of Amalur, apparently, though. Unfortunately. They, I mean, they did want to do an MMO in that world, but, you know. Well, I have this theory. I have this theory, Alex. That... You practically doom your game series if the first game has like a, like the colon and a subtitle. <laughs> Probably. You know what I, if if it was just called Kingdoms of Amalur, it would set up like a whole thing. But because they were so sure that they this was setting up a whole game world with like multiple games, they just they were like Kings of Amalur reckoning. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's sort of like Kingdom Come. Dot dot deliverance and you haven't seen See, another kingdom we'll, comes in <laughs> we'll need to do a thing about dead game series at some point yeah because we can get into legacy of kane at some point yeah i'm fascinated by the games that literally thought that they were going to be long-term game series that were going to have ton of entries they had the one yeah and that was it and, and oh i'm also fascinated by the games that had a decent lifespan and then died yeah, yeah, those are also so, kind of fascinating. If you want to hear us talk at some point about the Blood Omen Legacy of Cain game series and the death of the game series, let us know and maybe we can get into that in a segment at some point. And possibly the resurgence of that at some point. Yeah, doubtful. It's owned by Square Enix now. They've done nothing with it for over a decade. I the the only reason the only reason I mentioned that is because there was a very long video that H Bomber guy did just a few days ago about um, Deus Ex, uh, uh, what was it, Human Revolution, uh, and um, why why he was concerned about the changes that they made from a long dead series. It was alluded to that they could do something like that for Legacy of Cain, and if they changed that completely around? No, because they've 
we've had a bunch of canceled titles since Defiance came out. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyway, K- uh, Legacy of Kane r- redefying coming out soon. Redefiance. Undefiance. Nathan, if they want to find out more about our content, where can they find us? They can find us at TotalPebbleKnockdown.com. You've got to do the next part now. <laughs> I forget what the next part is. I don't usually do that. <laughs> you can, when you are there, you can find all of our content, and you can also click on our Patreon banner. We have full video episodes of the show that go up before the uh, individual parts go out, and uh, we also have early releases of a lot of our other content over there. Um, also, we'd like to thank our brand new uh, shiny level. I believe so. I think, think we have a shiny. Think, I forget what the titles are. Sorry. Uh, our shiny. brand new shiny level patron, uh, Granite Mink. Uh, if you want us to call you something different uh, in the things, uh, just let me know. We'll do that. Uh, but for now, that's what I'm going with. That's uh, awesome. so Thank you for supporting us and listening to the podcast, and hopefully you're enjoying this. And enjoy this sh- little bit of a shout out and to our other shiny and other patrons as well. Uh, yes. Adam, Seagoat, Cannibal Half on Gaming, and Bonnie. Bonnie as well. Yes. yes. <laughs> Thank you to all of you helping us keep the digital lights on here. Always glad to see us expanding and uh, getting more content out there. And uh, thank you for watching us on our YouTube channel because we do have those come out three times a week uh, for the individual segments. And uh, also thank you for uh, going over to the website and checking us out there. Uh, You can also find us on a little thing called Twitter. Uh, Still, surprisingly enough, I am at Satanium. I am at EXP Limited, and the show is at Pebble Knockdown. So you can always find us over there, and you can also find us on every podcast app known to mankind, which is uh, what pretty much Apple Podcast, Anchor, Spotify. Uh, yeah, we're still on there too. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I've got a whole link tree that I made with all the links on it. There's an iHeartRadio. There's a Google Play. It's all there, folks. We, you can find us on pretty much anything. Where podcasts are not sold but viewed. Oh God! Like Amazon that. Music, Anchor, Audible, Bre- uh, Breaker, iTunes, Pocket Cast, Radio Public, Spotify, whatever else I have not added. <laughs> yeah, all the ones that we haven't added yet, but they're what we're probably on. Sometimes I'll just go on random podcast apps, and it will be like, "Yeah, you know, you're on here, right? We are. Oh, all right. I'll take it. Didn't didn't know that." Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Sounds good. Um, so, uh, yeah, there is that. And uh, besides that, uh, I would say that uh, this reissuing of uh, Total Pebble Knockdown on number 25, we are at the quarter uh, century mark. Yeah, we're at one out of... Uh... One twelfth of what we had in the old show. There you go. <laughs> I can't math, I'm sorry. One twelfth of what we had in the old show. Not a bad uh, ratio. <laughs> yeah. So we only have to do this 12 times longer and we'll be able to uh, match, Retire. match our 300 episodes. Yeah. Yeah, 10 it's... years down the line. <laughs> yeah, 300 episodes. Yeah, that was a good six years. What do you? You've been podcasting for ten years. What do you have to show for it? Nothing. Eh. Nothing. I have nothing. A Got some lo- stickers. A lot of time that I had to spend doing stuff. <laughs> Just a lot of time in, folks. That's what we had. Uh, and some lovely folks we met along the way. Yes. Anyway, thank you all for joining us on this episode of Total Pebble Knockdown, and we will see you rolling down the road on. The- Next one. Still don't know how to do the outro. Do not roll down the road. No. No. Don't this do that. This is not advice for a healthy life. There's a falling rock sign. That they do, they mean business. We'll see you rolling down the place. We'll see you in the next one. 
Yeah, that's probably the best thing we've come up with. We'll see you that's later. Stealing it, so it's fine. It's okay. We'll see you later, Goodbye folks. Bye for now. Goodbye from the past. See you in the future. Bye, everybody. <laughs>